Welcome to the 2020 Watershed Congress. The Watershed Congress is organized by the Delaware Riverkeeper Network in collaboration with organizations like Stroud Water Research Center, who is moderating and presenting your session today as part of our mission to advance knowledge and stewardship of fresh water systems through global research, education, and watershed restoration. My name is Mandy Nix, Watershed Education Specialist at the Stroud Center and member of the Watershed Congress Organizing Committee. I am also your moderator for this session. Updates and improvements to the online water quality modeling application, Model My Watershed. I am so pleased to present today's speaker from Stroud Water Research Center, Dr. Dave R. Scott, Executive Director and Research Scientist, whose past research focuses include aquatic primary production, distribution and diversity of aquatic macroinvertebrates, ecohydrology, and the ecology of rivers and floodplains. Dave, I turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Mandy, for the nice introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to one hour uh, update on Model My Watershed. For those of you who are not familiar with Model My Watershed, you can find this application and use it for free online at wikiwatershed.org or go directly to the app through modelmywatershed.org. Uh, the, the application itself uh, was, has been uh, developed over about 12 years now uh, with contributions from many collaborators locally and around the country, and to name a few on the title slide there. And I'll get into the introduction of what Model My Watershed is in just a, a moment. Uh, just want to explicitly recognize uh, the team members that have contributed quite a bit of time and effort for the development of this app as shown on the screen here. As I mentioned, you can access these resources at wikiwatershed.org. There's a variety of uh, online resources relevant to uh, water, watershed ecology, uh, water, watershed management, et cetera, on Wiki Watershed. And you can find links to Model My Watershed and another uh, partner app called Monitor My Watershed. Today, I'll just be focusing on Model My Watershed. The, uh, the suite of tools, many of them made available under Wiki Watershed, have a uh, strong history of funding from the various funders. I'd like to acknowledge them before we get started. Most recently, funding from the William Penn Foundation, uh, specifically targeted to enhance tools available for those people involved in the Delaware River Watershed Initiative. So what is Wiki Watershed? It's a web toolkit to support uh, the public, uh, broad audience from citizens to conservation practitioners, educators, students to cleverly advance knowledge and stewardship of our environment and fresh water. Uh, today, what I'd like to do is go over a brief introduction of Model My Watershed. We'll go online and use the tool live in just a moment and highlight recently released features. And uh, if there's time, I'll share uh, some examples of projects where we've used these tools for conservation and restoration planning. Uh, probably won't be time, but I still like to mention that uh, the project work you do in Model My Watershed can be exported to a uh, third party archival and sharing uh, service called HydroShare, available at hydroshare.org. And uh, if I don't get a chance to talk about that today, you can find out more information in our technical help document resources online. Uh, we've also uh, integrated uh, some other modeling tools I won't have a chance to talk to, but those within the Delaware River Watershed Initiative may be familiar with SRAT or Stream Reach Assessment Tool, which we've embedded into Model My Watershed uh, called Hotspot or Subbasin Model. Uh, so this slide just shares with you the suite of tools that are available under Wiki Watershed. As I mentioned, there are several. We'll focus on Model My Watershed today for watershed modeling, analyzing geographic information, running uh, hydrologic models and nutrient runoff models, and comparing conservation and development scenarios and how resulting nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment loads, as well as runoff and infiltration change with changing conditions 
like land cover or implement best management practices. From the inception model my watershed, its vision has been to provide an easy to use pro-grade modeling package to inform land use decisions. Uh, and we've had always had a focus on the easy to use part, although the, you'll see that the web application is becoming a little bit more complex as we add more and more functionality. And as mentioned, it's freely available. Uh, you can see many different layers for the contiguous United States in Model My Watershed, and you can extract information from these layers that are then subsequently used for modeling. Here I'm uh, just illustrating the primary data layers from stream network to temperature and precip, elevation slope, the hydrologic soils group, and the national land cover uh, database. Right now that database is linked to the 2011 product, but we hope within the next six months we will be upgrading to the 2016 national land cover data set. What you won't be able to visualize, but is embedded in the back end of the modeling application and informs the watershed multi-year model are estimates from the USGS for um, ACE flow, it's linked to groundwater, groundwater nitrogen estimates, soil phosphorus estimates, soil nitrogen estimates, and uh, you can actually visualize the weather station network that we have uh, that is preloaded into Model My Watershed and the red points are the geographic location of these uh, long-term uh, climate and weather monitoring stations around the country. So with Model My Watershed, one can analyze land cover and all many of those data uh, layers that I had just shown. I'll share with you protected areas and active river area layers in just a moment. You can save and share your work and uh, and compare scenarios as you build out uh, possibilities for a parcel on the ground or a watershed. Within Model My Watershed, there are two primary uh, models, and the, the primary differences here are the site storm model uh, tends to be most appropriate for smaller scale, less than uh, one square mile down to maybe four acre. Uh, parcel, three acre parcel. So that's the site part of the title. And then storm site storm model refers to the fact that you would be modeling a 24 hour rain event and you can change the intensity of precipitation and then follow the changes that occur with runoff infiltration, evapotranspiration and sediment and nutrient uh, load runoff. The watershed multi-year model package uh, is more appropriate over larger spatial scales at the watershed level. And in its name, multi-year refers to the fact that the weather data that inform the model are uh, annual data. In most cases, it's 30 years of daily data that the model uses to produce annual and monthly uh, load estimates. So it's over a longer time horizon than the site storm model and typically results are viewed in annual output. We've recently added, and I'll touch on this with some visualizations, just in, in this year, 2020, we've added the ability uh, within the Delaware River watershed to analyze a prediction of future development that comes from folks at Shippensburg University, future development being predicted for the year 2100. We can analyze the active river area, protected lands layer, and then uh, most recently we have updated the watershed multi-year model so that the user could upload their own weather data, temperature and precipitation, uh, and automatically use an estimate of future climate, future weather for the Delaware uh, watershed geography. And that links to that future development. The predictions are for uh, future daily temperature and precipitation in the year 2100. 
There are other uh, possible future releases that are forthcoming as well that are listed there. This is an open source software uh, project and we share much of the code and details on all the data layers through a GitHub repository. And I'll show you where you can link that if you're interested in accessing the detailed backend information. So here's where I click over to the internet and uh, we'll start with wikiwatershed.org. So let me just flip over there. So now we're in a browser and this is wikiwatershed.org landing page. We'll be clicking on Model My Watershed and launch the app in just a moment. But before I go there, I'd like to point out uh, the help page uh, up here on the top menu where you can find uh, manuals, tutorials, and uh, other important information to help you out. So we've organized our help resources based on the uh, tool that's under the Wiki Watershed domain. So click on view help resources for model my watershed and you'll see a list of different resources here. Uh, particularly I'd like to draw your attention to model my watershed technical documentation. This document will provide, um, if not very detailed information about all the data layers and the models, then there will be links to third party websites where you can access very detailed information on um, components of Model My Watershed. We, we may come back to that in a little bit. So for now, I'll go back to Model My Watershed and I will launch the application. You'll notice the URL changes to modelmywatershed.org up top. So this is a standalone uh, application that's actually running on the Amazon Web Service Cloud. Uh, we've tried to design this in a way that we call sort of breadcrumbing, uh, an intuitive way to get users to explore uh, a website. And you'll see that uh, primarily the interface is map based. If you click on the layers tab, you can hide or show uh, these different uh, palettes on the layers tab. And I'm going to click to the base maps and just point out that there's a variety of different types of base maps that you can choose. Uh, I'm going to choose terrain to start. Uh, and then you can explore each one of these layers that has the data sets that we saw from the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so for example, uh, we have the stream network or the national land cover data set with a color coded key adjacent uh, to the text there. Really though, what we want to do is uh, define an area of interest that we can analyze. So we just click get started. And there are a number of different ways to select an area on the map. You can select by boundaries. If you don't know what USGS pucks are, these are sub basins uh, related to the surficial hydrology uh, throughout the United States with huck eights being a larger geography than the higher numbered hucks, huck 12s would be smaller watershed units. And we can zoom into any area then. And when we hover over the map, we can see the name of what that hydrologic unit is called. There, there are a variety of other tools. You can free draw, you can drop a square kilometer. Uh, you can delineate a watershed by clicking on the map and you can upload a file from a GIS uh, desktop application like ArcGIS, Shapefiles, or GeoJSON, if you know what those are. For now, I'm just going to select a boundary, uh, the Huck 12, as an example, uh, by clicking on the map. And when we do that, it tells the software to extract the data, uh, data from the underlying data layers and provide a summary to the user. So it was spinning on the left side and um, ultimately finished its analysis or Hassler Run, Mill Creek, Huck 12 subwatershed. We can see how large the subwatershed is here. And then we have a variety of tabs related to these different geographic features. The first being the stream network statistics. Uh, we have first through 10th order streams. These are the smallest headwater streams and the largest uh, bodies of water like the Mississippi 
or the Ohio River uh, or the main stem Delaware may be uh, in the 7, 8, 9, 10 category. So you get the total length and the mean channel slope from those data. And if you would like to download those data to a spreadsheet, you can click download and you'll be asked to save the file as a CSV that you can open in a Excel spreadsheet. You'll also see at the bottom here that we've summarized the length of all of these streams that flow through agricultural areas and non-agricultural areas. We've added this because um, particularly for our work, we do quite a bit of work in agricultural setting, uh, considering uh, stream side activities in agricultural lands and where there are opportunities to help farmers uh, address their land stewardship next to streams by keep fencing out livestock, planting trees, et cetera. So this gives us an indication in this geography of perhaps how many opportunities by stream kilometer there might be. There's a land cover uh, table that gives you the categories from the National Land Cover Database in both percentage for the area as well as uh, square kilometers here. We can sort any of these columns to bring the largest land cover type to the top. We also see the third column, uh, data column here, fourth column, uh, active river area and the land cover that's broken down within the active river area. And if you're wondering what the active river area is, there's a data layer that you can visualize uh, here on cover grid that shows you the active river area as defined by this data set. Uh, I'm happy to share where this data comes from uh, at, at a later time or in the chat box later. Uh, in addition, with the land cover, you'll notice a drop down box. And this is one of the new features that we've just uh, added this year so that one can see what the acreage is of protected lands in this area. So now the polygons have changed colors uh, and locations to represent what we know to be protected land in very different categories from federal, state, local, uh, park or recreational natural resource, ag easements and conservation easements. And you get a summary table down below. We are not, however, at this point, delivering you the land cover within those uh, polygons. You might have noticed two other layers that you can now see uh, under the summary tab. One is the DRB 2100 land forecast for centers. This is a brand new data layer that we uh, have uploaded as a collaborative project from uh, Shippensburg University. Their um, geospatial analysis center run by uh, Claire Jantz, where she's run a predictive model to uh, predict the future land cover within the Delaware River Basin. Uh, you, however, we're only visualizing on the map in red the developed land. Uh, the other details for the remaining land categories are shown in the table on the left. So the table has been updated and now this is the land cover distribution for this future development scenario. Now the word centers here refers to the type of uh, future development modeling scenario that was implemented. Centers refers to a constraint on new development to business centers or centers of present day uh, uh, developed activity, commercial and industrial activity. There is a second scenario that we've loaded up here called corridors, uh, where uh, development is allowed to occur also along transportation corridors uh, out into the future. Uh, you can also download all of those data at the bottom if you so desire. Quickly, a couple other data layers in here that are important for modeling the hydrologic soils uh, throughout this geography, color-coded and summarized to the left. Uh, there's a terrain tab that gives you access to 
a um, elevation map that underlies uh, the visualization system here. So for this polygon, you're seeing the average elevation slope minimum and maximum. Uh, because we had to build the color scheme for the entire United States, if you're in a small geography, you may not see much color contrast for elevation, uh, but the slope may be more useful for visualizations to see where steep and um, less steep slopes occur uh, in your area of interest. We also have a climate tab that um, you can uh, visualize. However, uh, the visualization is better at a national scale than a local scale. And you can see the slider down here is also by month. Uh, but the data on the left hand side show you the mean annual precipitation patterns in this area uh, and the mean annual temperature or uh, mean uh, monthly uh, temperature patterns uh, along with those data down at the bottom. Uh, second to last tab I'll talk about is uh, point sources. If you have a, a permitted point source in your geography, uh, let's see, I need to deselect precipitation uh, and turn on. We have two National Pollution Discharge Elimination System uh, permitted discharge points in this geography. And when I hover over, you can see the blue dot pop up and we can see some metadata so that you could link through and find this station on the EPA website uh, for either of those stations. Uh, we also have an estimate of the number of farm animals that comes from the county level ag census data. This comes in to play when we run one of the models. All right, so that was a fairly long introduction to just the analyze feature, uh, but very useful information can quickly be returned to the user for your area of interest. And then if you have a desire to do some uh, hydro hydrologic modeling and nutrient modeling, uh, we have the model tab that you can uh, move on to. And we have two choices, site storm model and the watershed multi-year model. I'm gonna start with the watershed multi-year model because this contains uh, recent updates that I'd like to highlight. So when we click on the watershed multi-year model, we engage the software to start running the model algorithms. And what's happening here is the model is fetching a 30-year temperature and precipitation data file that has 30 years of daily data in it and pushing those data through this hydrologic model. The model then partitions uh, precipitation using land cover, soils, elevation, temperature, et cetera, into a prediction of stream flow, which you see on the left, or surface runoff, subsurface flow, point source flow, evapotranspiration, or you can see Sort of the raw precipitation input and you have a summary table of these statistics down at the bottom. Of course we uh, if you want to know where the, pre the precipitation and temperature data are coming you can um, turn on the weather station data and search for the nearest two yellow dots and you can see that at this time we're pulling the weather data from this particular station and the station over here near the Susquehanna. Okay, and we'll zoom back in. On the uh, water quality side, we have average annual loads from the 30 years of daily fluxes that um, account for sediment, nitrogen, and phosphorus loading uh, that would come out of this polygon or this watershed to the creek. So you get total load, loading rates, mean annual concentrations, and mean low flow. And you get um, the partition of those loads into the different land use, land cover categories that you can see on the left here, as well as um, what might result from farm, an farm animal density in this area, stream bank erosion, subsurface flow, point sources, and septic systems. And you can download those data. 
I'm sure there's lots of questions if you're brand new to modeling. Be happy to answer offline or um, in our help documentation, but just for the sake of time and demonstration, uh, we'll, we'll keep moving on. So we've done the initial modeling run, and what we might be interested in is tweaking the model, changing the model, or building scenarios, implementing best management practices, or changing land use. And one can do that by clicking on the add changes to this area text over on the right hand side. When you do that, there's a few things to note. First off, you'll see you have a new scenario over here that now allows you to diverge from current conditions. So current conditions is saved and can't be modified, but your new scenario can be modified. You can rename this to exa you know, example um, changes is what I'll name it to right now. And you can begin changing things. There's lots to explore and discover here. I'm gonna start with land cover. Uh, if we go back and turn on the national land cover grid and zoom in a little bit just to get a better picture. We click on land cover up here and what uh, pops up is the land cover table uh, for the categories needed for modeling. This table is a little different from the land cover table you saw in Analyze because several of the categories are merged together. For example, wooded areas include evergreen, deciduous, and mixed categories. And you can see the, uh, not the amount of land cover in hectares in this case. I have a metric uh, choice for my units. And they're sort of grayed out, you can't highlight them, but these would be the uh, 2011 data that are in current conditions. So you can modify any of these numbers as long as your total continues to add up to, in this case, 4,500 hectares, and it needs to be exact. So if I, for example, um, take 500, uh, 700 hectares out of woodlands, uh, th then I would have um, 1,082.4. And um, let's put 500 of that in the hay pasture. So I would have 2,046.8. I should have. Um, I'm not sure I did that exactly right. Uh, regardless of what I just did, I need to put uh, 200 more hectares in and I'm gonna add that to cropland, which would be 885. And you might have to play around with the decimal to get the red to go away. So now I've modified land cover and I can hit save. And the model reruns and updates. So, now I would like to do a different scenario and I'm going to keep what I've done. So I'm going to duplicate this scenario. Duplicate is not currently working for me. Sometimes there's a little glitch uh, that happens. So I'm rather going to add a new scenario and just title this example two. And this time under land cover, instead of manipulating 2011 land cover for something that you know, I'm interested in, I am gonna choose to use the forecast from the Delaware River Basin land forecast for 2100. And I'm gonna choose the centers corridor. And when I click on that, this table's automatically updated based on the data in that other data layer. So this is a brand new feature that we've just added and we can hit save. Uh, and now the model has rerun and updated all of the data. And I'll, I'll show you the comparison view in just a moment. Uh, I'm going to do yet one more new scenario. And I'm going to choose the same future forecast. But in addition to that, I'm going to, oh, I forgot to log in. There we go. 
I'm going to choose the weather data tab. And this is, this is also a very recent update as well. Uh, available in the watershed multi-year model only, the user can upload their own custom precipitation and temperature data. Uh, they'd have to prepare those data in Excel or a spreadsheet and have a, a comma separated value CSV file to then upload. Or you, if you're in the Delaware River Basin, you can choose from one of two future weather simulations that also co um, come from our partners at Shippensburg University. Uh, RCP 4.5 is from the um, global climate models. It's an average of something like 11 or 14 global climate models for a mid-range estimate for greenhouse gases uh, in the year 2100. Uh, and technically, we are choosing a data file that has daily temperature and precipitation produced for every day between 2080 and 2099. So there's 20 years of daily data in this preloaded file that we would be selecting. So the 4.5 is for a mid-range greenhouse gas emissions. The 8.5 is for the high estimate. So those are choices that you can then model, select and click done. The model should be rerunning in the background. And uh, hopefully if everything works in the end, when we click our compare function, we should have a summary that is based that um, has two views, a hydrology view and a water quality view. And uh, has scenarios color coded for each of the scenarios that I just ran that also provides summary statistics for the modifications that we added to our project. And you can then visualize the monthly average estimate for stream flow or surface runoff for subsurface flow point source. We're not predicting future point sources of evapotranspiration and precipitation. All right, in, in, the case, uh, in the case of precipitation, we really just have the 1960 to 1990 data and the 2080 to uh, 2099 data. Uh, so there's only two colors visible uh, to the eye, but um, all four scenarios have precipitation under there. So that's for water um, hydrology. And we also have a water quality tab where you can look at the total load estimate for sediment, nitrogen, and phosphorus relative to the differences we see. Uh, if you're logged in, you can then share your project by turning on link sharing, copying the link, and sending it to a colleague. If you copy the link and send it to a colleague, they cannot edit your project. Your project is safe and can only be modified by you. If you connect your account to HydroShare and turn export on, uh, you'll be asked to submit a title and an abstract and a keyword, and then the software will send your project to this third party resource called HydroShare, where you can share it, but you can also share it and basically give it to somebody so they can modify your project and own its derivative without uh, affecting your source project. Uh, but that's probably uh, subject for another uh, time period to go into details on how to do that. Next, I'd just quickly like to jump back out and give you another example with a new project and run through the site storm model. So for this example, I'm gonna upload a file uh, Assuming that you all have some knowledge of GIS and ArcGIS, uh, and you know what a shapefile is or a GeoJSON, if you have a polygon that you're working with and you don't want to redraw it here in Model My Watershed, you can save the shapefile in a zip file that contains all of the relevant shapefile uh, components. And so I would just quickly show you uh, what that means. So here is the zip file for uh, 
uh, a shape in ArcGIS that contains all of the other related files, but ultimately it's the shape file that we're most interested in. So I have this zip package. And once I uh, select upload file here, you can see that it says drag or drop or select a file. I'm just gonna go grab my shape file or my zip and bring it in here and drop it in the box. And as I do that, the polygon within the shape file will be ingested and used to start analyzing the project area similar to what we have already done, but with the HUC8 feature. And so you have all the summary statistics that we saw before. This time I'm gonna to go to model and I'm gonna choose uh, site storm model. The site storm model, remember from my introduction, is um, a 24 hour storm event on this parcel. So the first thing to note is we have a precipitation slider up top here that ranges from zero to 10 inches for a 10, for a 24 hour rainstorm. This simple um, site storm model then partitions the, the precipitation into evapotranspiration runoff and infiltration using uh, a couple well-known algorithms TR55 was developed for agricultural and more natural landscapes and SLAM for the more urban landscapes. Uh, so we see a bar chart for a 1.9 inch rain event, giving us the inches for infiltration, runoff, and evapotranspiration. Now I'm gonna dial this up to something that's more close to maybe a two year return interval storm event. I know at Philadelphia Airport, the long-term two-year return interval storm is about three and a quarter inches over 24 hours. Uh, and we can see the runoff now is measurable or uh, it predicts a measurable amount at 0.2 out of the three inches for this landscape. We also have this connected to a water quality model. This is the EPA's spreadsheet tool uh, to predict um, loading or nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. So it's, it's a simpler model. It's a shorter uh, term look at it, one day storm event. But we also allow the user to change things in the area. The choices are different. It doesn't perfectly align with the choices you have in the watershed multi-year model. But you can modify land cover uh, to do this you actually draw over the top of an existing land cover. I happen to choose a almost entirely forested landscape. Uh, but say we were interested in the, uh, protecting this parcel and wanted to have some information, hey, if we don't protect it and this land gets developed, what might be the changes that could occur? So uh, say you might have a, a hotel that might be uh, proposed for this area or a shopping center uh, that might generate impervious surfaces that account for 50 to 79 percent of the area you draw. So we select that tool and we start drawing. Okay, I think my hotel might go in uh, over here, uh, you know, on the ridge, and I draw my polygon to a size that I feel is reasonable. Double click to close the polygon. And the model starts updating and now we have implemented developed medium intensity right and i'm going to switch my microphone because i think i love that okay hopefully everyone can hear still uh, so just like in the watershed multi-year model we can compare our scenarios and look at Dave, you are on mute for some reason. Your voice is cut out.
Dave, can you hear me? I think you are on mute for some reason. Your voice is cut out. And I have alluded to estimating water quality benefits for land preservation. We've been doing this uh, for um, a bunch of projects for land preservation in the Delaware with this modeling approach. Uh, we're modeling a wide range of conditions to bound the possibilities of um, the lack of forest protection on a parcel. And we've been using that site storm model running scenarios that include um, developing it at a best professional judgment level, developing it to 100% open developed, low density, medium density, high density. So many different scenarios. And this, this is an example of a parcel where we've implemented developed high intensity uh, land for a portion of this parcel. We do that for a wide variety of scenarios. And now we've generated a range of possibilities uh, for all of these scenarios with the best professional judgment of development all the way to the right. Otherwise I've arranged these sort of sequentially what we would hypothesize to impact runoff with a little bit of development to a maximum amount of development. We can also look at those patterns uh, for water quality. We did this for about 46 parcels throughout the Delaware. This just gives you the average of all those different types of parcels. Perhaps, am I still muted? Doesn't look like it. Uh, you great. Average, so ultimately by averaging and looking at the variation of all those different parcels, we can generate some um, average statistics and variability among the parcels for these scenarios. The top panel here is runoff in inches for a two year return interval storm event. The bottom panel is infiltration for that same storm event. All right, and then you, we can also um, add up the total volume from all 46 of those parcels and look at total runoff volume. If um, this is helpful, if we wanna make estimates for having to manage that excess stormwater from all those different parcels. Now we have a volume that, um, that we can manage. Uh, so the top panel is total runoff volume, bottom panel is total, um, the difference in total runoff volume from current conditions. And likewise, we can do that for Total suspended solids on the upper left, total phosphorus on the upper right, total nitrogen on the lower left. So I know this was a quick and dirty example uh, because of limited time and there's, I'm sure there's plenty to talk about with that sort of approach. Uh, but I'd like to leave time for questions. So I'll end it there, but um, also just share with you that um, the presentations made possible from the Stroud Water Research Center as well as uh, supporting the Watershed Congress made possible in part by a grant from uh, Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection's Growing Greener program to support this consortium for scientific assistance to watersheds. So if you need technical assistance and you're within the state of Pennsylvania, um, you can go to this website, c-saw.info, read more about it and reach out and request some support from us as well as our partners. So I'll end it there and um, thank of course the funders uh, and, and thank you all for attending. All right, big thank you, Dave. Uh, that was incredibly helpful and informative on what is an award winning uh, web app. So I've got a few questions already popping up on how people can best utilize this in their day-to-day -day lives, whether it be with restoration or education or a citizen science field. There's a lot of uses for it. And our first question comes from a participant who is wondering, historically, 
we were able to develop a .gms file and then upload this to the GWLF eProgram or the map shed to further calibrate and refine the variables. Are there any plans to continue this capability? Yes, that capability is still available. And uh, I glossed over that in um, because of time. And I think I might be having some network complications that yeah. might be slowing things down. Huh. Um, so this is going back to the first project I did showing the use of the watershed multi-year model, which uh, the I guess Michael's quite familiar about GWLFE and map sheds. That was the precursor uh, to what we've incorporated into Model My Watershed. You can see right up top that you can now, you can still export this .gms file so that you can bring it in to your desktop GWLFE application and do the modifications, um, further calibrate um, your For some reason, you've gone out again, Dave, on your sound, and I'm not sure why. Okay, just a moment. Oh, you came back. You came back. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, what, um, yes, you can download the GMS. No, you cannot upload a GMS file into Model My Watershed. That's the simple answer. Mm, okay. Um, and if your network allows, we might have enough time for you to point out exactly where this feature is if they're having trouble finding it with the updates. Um, we have one question so far left. And again, for any other folks listening, oh, another just popped up. Uh, we've got a few more minutes for questions, about 10 to be exact. So if you've got any while Dave is here, um, please pop on onto that Q&A. All right, Dave. All right. Yes. So let me know. So, yep. so I see something from Chuck Marshall here on TMDLs, total maximum daily loads are specified as concentrations and model my watershed calculates uh, runoff loads. Uh, can one relate the two? So yes, you have access to concentrations as well using the watershed multi-year model. Uh, if you're working with TMDLs and need that. So I didn't go into that detail, um, but you can see, you know, loads, loading rates, mean annual concentration, mean low flow. Um, if you're doing this in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, just note that uh, the state of Pennsylvania has been working the TMDL program previously with the use of MapShed and GWLFE model. And the watershed multi-year model is just that. It's the next generation of that program. So this is also something that Pennsylvania DEP continues to use for their TMDL modeling. Um, I think they accept this in some of their PRP proposals, pollution reduction plan proposals. Uh, so there's that bit of information. Great, thank you, Dave. I'll take this other question that we have. We've got two in the queue right now. The first is about TMDLs, which are specified as concentrations. Oh, that's the one I just answered. Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Okay. Um, so then, mm, yes. Okay. And the next one is, is there any model studies for Great Marsh in Northern Chester County um, published with interpretation? That answer, I won't be able to give you. I'm, I'm not sure, Jim. Uh, Certainly if I come across any, I, I know who you are and how to contact you. So I can share those if I come across any. And that concludes any questions I see. We've got a few more minutes. So let's give folks a second to kind of um, catch their breath and see if there's anything else they're wondering. The great part about this app is its versatility. So as Dave kind of navigated for us, there's a lot that you can do with it depending on your field of study whether you're a watershed professional or you're actually working in education. I, I guess I would conclude by just saying this is a ongoing development of this software. So, you know, depending on funding, uh, we have updates that occur. So, 
if, if you see something that you think is um, useful for us to consider, I'd encourage you to share your thoughts. Um, let's see if I go back to Wiki Watershed. We have a contact page. So there are ways in here to one report bugs, but also share your thoughts for future features or just ask questions about how something works. Before you ask questions about how something works, we do have a frequently asked questions portion on the website. So check the FAQs first. And Dave, while we see if we have any other questions trickle in, I'm wondering, what if, hypothetically speaking, someone said, you know, Model My Watershed seems like an awesome tool as part of the Wiki Watershed Toolkit. It may be a little advanced for the kids I'm working with or even adults. I want to acclimate them with a version that is a little more of a caricature, a little more cartoonish, uh, more of a 101. Is there anything like that that exists? Yeah, so, you know, I, um, in my presentation, I presented this more towards the conservation practitioner or watershed practitioner out there. But in fact, we started the development of Model My Watershed really as a education platform for middle and high school students and undergraduate students. So um, we have ongoing uh, projects to build curricula for teachers to use in schools. So we have a curricula uh, page that um, really brings things down to a basic introductory level. And there are you know, tutorials and videos as well as you know, other example projects that you can work through here. And I know Mandy's involved in some of this, so um, one could reach out to her as well uh, for further explanation of these resources. Absolutely. I don't see any more questions, so I wonder um, if it's worth leaving you with the main Model My Watershed page, where they could, if they so choose, explore that further. Um, and the runoff simulation is there linked as well as a great tool if they they wanted to explore further. Yeah, this is a nice learning cartoon that uh, helps one understand the basic principles of runoff and infiltration. Uh, it's fun to play around with as you change land covers, uh, the system dynamically, the graphic dynamically updates. There's a precipitation slider to put greater intensity storm event uh, through this square of land or less. You can change land cover. You can go from high infiltration soils to very slow infiltration soils and see how infiltration, runoff, and evapotranspiration change. And that is called the runoff simulation. <laughs> Brilliant. So to not take up any more of your time, I think it is perfect now to come to a close with the Watershed Congress. If we see any more questions pop up in the next five minutes, we're happy to take them if time allows. But for now, as we wrap up our session, I do want to take a moment to thank our speaker, once again, Dave R. Scott, for taking the time to share his research with us and everything he knows about the latest updates and improvements to model my watershed. And have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.